right to do worthy. Thank you that you are he who hears prayer, delight in the prayers of the upright, and hear the prayers of the righteous. And Lord, we just pray that you just give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to perceive. Give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. To yeah. incline our hearts to your word, so that we may see and understand what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We just want to welcome the Holy Spirit in here. Yes, Lord. We want our hearts and our minds to be tuned in to God and all the other stuff that's contrary to God's Word and our fleshly emotions. We need to take them and put them over to the side and put them under the blood of Jesus so that we can hear what God has got to say to us today because we're coming together for a reason. And the reason is that he has something that he wants to share with us. And there's a couple of things that I'm going to, I feel like the Lord wants me to share. I wrote, them, wrote a lot of it down as I was reading. I've been in Mark, the fifth chapter of Mark, about the healing of a demon-possessed man. If you go to the fifth chapter of Mark and you read that, uh, it will show you the love that God has irregardless of who you are or where you come from. And this this man was demon possessed and um, I think God must have said to him, What is your name? And the guy and, and the man said, My name is Legion. Well what does Legion mean? Legion means there's many, 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 many spirits that has a, that's been affecting this man for years and years and years and and he wanted to be free from it and God set him free and I think what I really want to share is after he was set free from the legion of demons that he'd been possessed with for so many years he wanted to go with Jesus and Jesus said no, this is what I want you to do. And how many people have always heard me say that your mess becomes your message and whatever you go through in life becomes your testimony. Yeah. And this is exactly what he was telling this young gentleman here because the people where this man lived wanted Jesus to get out of their country, get out of their city because they were afraid of him because he delivered a guy that had been demon to possess for years and years and the things that this man would do was unreal. But Jesus said to him, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed begged to go with him. This is the 18th verse of the 5th chapter. Jesus did not let him, but he said, and this is something that I share with people all the time, go home to your family Tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and all the people were amazed. Your mess becomes your message. Whatever, you, whatever you've been fighting and been dealing with your entire life that was not of God, that was something the enemy had aggravated you with ever since you was a kid growing up or whatever, and you get delivered, then there's other people out there that's going through the same thing that you've been going through for so many years that that if you can share with them how God has brought you through it, it will be a testimony to them and they'll come through it. And I believe that very much, that your best does become your message. And then the other thing that that I was reading in Mark 11, 24 through 26, uh, about prayer, how we pray, uh, I read the scripture here and, and it blesses me, but I think sometimes we as Christians don't really pay attention to this one scripture. So I'm going to bring it out and I'm going to leave it with you and you pray about it and let God deal with you on it throughout your lifetime, the week, 
we said in Mark 24 through 26, the 24th verse says, Therefore I, Jesus, tell you that whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Now a lot of folks believe that whenever they pray, and so many people will, so many Christian people will pray, but they'll never, they will never pray in the name of Jesus. And the only way you can get to the Father is through the Son. If you don't believe it, go back and start reading in the Old Testament where, where, uh, God told Moses to appoint, uh, Aaron as a priest, and the only way that they could get forgiveness of sins was whenever they brought their, uh, uh, things to the altar, then, then, uh, Aaron covered, before he went into the, the place of worship where God was, he had to, he had to walk through the blood. And it's very important that we can't get to the Father without going through the Son. You can't, you can pray all day long, but if you don't pray, in the name of Jesus, you you've messed up. It's not going to be answered like it's supposed to be answered because you've got to go through Jesus. He is the one that's standing in front or standing beside God interceding for us because he's done been through everything you've been through or you're going through. Jesus has done suffered everything that you're suffering. So he we don't know sometimes how to pray and we pray, but God knows Jesus knows how to interpret that prayer to to God the way it's supposed to be so we can get delivered. Do you see, understand what I'm saying? Therefore, I, Jesus, tell you that whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it. If you don't believe you received it, why pray? If you pray unbelieving, you're not going to get it. And and but, but believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, now listen to this, and when you stand praying, you, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins, and then he'll hear the prayer that you're praying. Now how many of us do that? That's why come a lot of times we don't get delivered because we still hold an anger and unforgiveness and resentment and everything toward everybody else and we're not cleaning up what we're supposed to be cleaning up in our lives. We got to learn to forgive. Jesus said when he was on that cross out there looking at all the people and I've said this so many times and I'll say it until my dying day. He's hanging on a cross and there's people out there that have watched him minister and heal and deliver and and, and do the, the miracles that he did. And what are they saying to him? If you're who you say you are, come off the cross. They're not believing. Even his disciples, except for one, walked away from him. Went back to their old thing, fishing. How many of us do that? Because the prayer don't get answered. We say, well, he don't pay no attention to us. We might as well go and do what we've always done. That ain't the way it works. The last thing that Jesus said was, looking it out, out there, don't you, can you imagine how he must have felt when he looked and his disciples were not there with him? Except for one. The, the, the years that they walked together and ministered together and they left it because he's on the cross. What do we do? Put ourselves in that position. What do we do? He said, Father, now this is what Jesus said before he died. Knowing that he had been brutally crucified, beaten, and all this stuff mistreated. Unrecognizable on that cross. And what he said was, Father, forgive them. Can we do that? Well, they don't know what they're doing. Can we forgive somebody that's made fun of us or talked about us or spit on us or cussed us. Can we do that? Well, if you have been filled with the Spirit, if you've become a Christian and, and you're truly having a relationship with God, our responsibility is to not look at the bad in the other person but begin to start loving them and forgiving them and, and, and praying for them and pulling the good out of them 
and not all the bad. That's what God wants us to do. But we as human beings, and I'm talking about so-called Christians that go to church every Sunday, clap their hands and shout and carry on and walk out the door and do the same thing they've always done before they ever went into the building. They think they're going to make it. It ain't going to work. We got to have a one-on-one intimate relationship with God. And he said, and when you stand praying to God the Father through the Son of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, if you hold anything against anyone, you have to forgive them right then so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins and hear and answer your prayer. Amen. If you don't forgive, God don't forgive. If you hold anger and unresentment against someone, you might as, you know, you know, gotta be honest. You gotta be honest with God how you feel. I had to be honest with God how I felt about my relationship in my marriage. I had to make him understand. I had, go see, God already knows what's in your heart. You gotta be honest with God and I had to tell God how much I hated my husband. I hated him so much I said I wouldn't even spit on him if he was on fire. Because I have to be honest. And I'm very honest now with God about every single thing that I deal with on a daily basis. Looking, even sitting in the office this past week, people that have mistreated me, that I tried to help, that I didn't try, that I helped a lot. I was going to pick up the phone and call them. And remind them of something that they needed to do pertaining to me. And I'm sitting there at my desk and all of a sudden God said, hush, be quiet. And shocked me and I said, what you talking about? He said, I have, I told you to put them and it on the altar and leave it there. Because see, I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to be the one to, uh, defend you. They'll stand before me one day, and if it's not right, if we don't get things right on this earth when we stand before God, you know what? There's a lot of folks not going to make it into heaven because of the attitude and the unforgiveness and the resentment. Even though they call themselves Christians, they go to church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday, every time the doors are open, but yet they're holding anger and unresentment and unforgiveness. And I don't know why I'm on this, but I'm telling you, it is very important that if you can't forgive, God won't forgive. We got to judge ourselves and quit judging the other person. We got to pray for that other person. God lets you know what's going on in that other person's life. He let, you know, you know the kind of attitude that person has. And it's up to us. To intercede and pray for that person because see, that person's not going to make it if he ain't got it all right with God. And if we're holding anger and, unres- and resentment and unforgiveness in our hearts, you're not going to, you know what, God's got books, he's got names, and whenever we stand before God, if you're booked there with your name, he's going to look and if your name is not there, he's going to say, I don't know who you are, leave. And you're going to bust hell wide open. That's how important it is about forgiving, unforgiveness, and forgiving. It's very important. It's always so easy to judge that other person. We need to judge us before we judge that other person. Did you hear what I said, audience? We need to judge us in our hearts and clean it up before we judge the other person. It's our responsibility as Christians, as children of God. We call ourselves Christians. We call ourselves prayer warriors. But yet we're holding anger and unforgiveness about whoever. It could be your next door neighbor. It could be a family member. It could be somebody that you work with. It don't make any difference who it is. It's our responsibility. Jesus died on a cross. He took the sins of this entire world. Every kind of sin that you can imagine on his body. And became a final sacrifice for us. 
So we don't have to suffer that. And why do we choose to do it? We don't choose to do it. The enemy puts it there to keep us from coming higher up into the revelation of God. To coming higher up into uh, 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 and, and having an experience with God like we've never had before. It's time for us to grow up as God's children. Be honest, he's your daddy. I call him daddy all the time. I say, thank you for being my daddy. Because when I get out of line, a daddy that loves you is going to spank you. He's going to correct you. He's going to reprove you. And if you love your daddy, you're going to listen to what your daddy is saying and you're going to take and, and pay attention and you're going to do what he tells you to do because he's your father. And I say, daddy, whip me every time I get out of order. Just whip me because I know if you do, you love me. If I don't never get a spanking by my father, then you don't love me. Something's going on. Amen? I, I don't know. I, I pray that y'all received what I'm trying to say to you. Number one, the mess that we, whatever we go through in life, whatever you have experienced in your life, whatever kind of life that you have lived and God has changed you and delivered you from it, that becomes your message to whoever you come in contact with. Period. I've never done drugs. So I don't know nothing about drugs. But there's people that's done drugs that God's delivered them from drugs and you know, you know exactly the temptation and, and everything that, that goes along with the temptation of doing drugs. But God is wanting to use you to help those people understand how God can deliver you from that. I went through a terrible marriage. But I thank God my husband's in heaven today. Bless his heart. I praise God for that. For two years of our 50 year marriage, he and I went to church, read the word, prayed together. But prior to that, it was awful. And I never understood why. And it was because he thought church was going to take me away from him. And if he hadn't fought like he did, I'd have ended up with religion and not a relationship with God. There's a difference in religion and relationship. A lot of folks don't understand that. They think because you go, because you go to church every Sunday, you clap your hands, uh, you, you, you shake your hair off, you, you just have whatever. They think that, okay. And then they go outside the church and they're doing the same thing they was doing before they ever went in there. That's religion. A relationship with God is you don't do the same things you've always done. You ask God to help you overcome it. It, and, and having an intimate relationship with God. And I tell him all the time, whatever's in me, Lord, that I don't know this in me, you created me, you know me, you know what's in me that you hate, bring it to the surface, show it to me, so I can be delivered from it. That's my heart's cry to my Father on a daily, daily basis. So our mess becomes our message. What you've been through in life becomes your testimony. And it becomes a way of you helping others come out of that. And then when we pray, when we stand before God and pray, first of all, we got to clean ourselves up and out and be honest with God. And then those prayers will be answered. And we don't doubt. He don't answer them like we want them answered. But they will be answered if you'll continue to trust and believe Him. Amen? Amen. Well, I just... Uh, I tell you, God's a, such a wonderful, He's a good Father. And we do communion here every Saturday. And I, I just, I hope that people understand what it means about the cross that Jesus was on and, and the struggle and, the, and what He went through. And what it means about doing communion. Uh, I think about I think about the many they say stripes. The Bible says by my stripes. Jesus said by my stripes you're healed. He also said as often as you do communion do it in remembrance of what I've done for you. But you know what? I don't, I don't like to, to say stripes. Because you just think you're just getting a little switch and you're getting a switch and you're just switching. Just a stripe. 
you have to imagine and see the kind of of beating that he got with the cat of nine tails and what they looked like and what was in the end of each one of those tails. Something very sharp. And then the guy that was had that cat of nine tails in his hands hated Jesus. He hated him. Why did he hate him? Because he never done anything wrong. All he ever done was good. Why do, why do we, why do we walk away from him? Because all Jesus ever done was good. But he took that cat of nine tails and they had Jesus standing out there and he was tied. His hands were tied. And can you imagine, now they say by my stripes. Can you imagine the cat of nine tails with the thorns and with the, the stones that was the end of those nine tails when they, whenever he hit him, he didn't just hit him like that. He hated his guts. He hit him as hard as he could. And it wrapped around his whole entire body. And when he pulled it back, it pulled skin and everything back. I never realized the depth of, of that beating until I read Psalms 22, where David prophesied. Now people take the Old Testament and say, you know what, we don't have to deal with the Old Testament anymore. But if you didn't have the Old Testament, you wouldn't have the New Testament because the Old Testament was prophesying Jesus coming into this world. And David prophesied the condition of the body of Christ when he was beaten. And it said that his intestines were showing. They had beat him so bad and pulled that, his skin off so bad that his intestines were showing. He was beaten so bad that he, he did not have the energy to carry his cross for them to nail him to the cross. So they had to get somebody to help him carry that cross. And can you imagine the beating that he got and how he looked and everything and then they laid him down. Just picture this. They laid him down on the cross. Nailed his hands and his feet to that cross. Already had a hole dug for the cross to go into. They laid him. He was laying down. They didn't nail him while he was hanging up there. He was laying down. Nailed him to the cross. They picked that cross up. And do you think they eased it into that hole? They threw it in there. With him hanging. I mean his neck, hands and his feet. Can you imagine the jar that it, that his body took? This is what Jesus went through for us. For our sins. For our healing. We just think that it's bread and, and juice. But it's not. It's in remembrance of what he did for us. And then once they had him on the cross. They had a crown of thorns. A crown. And then, yeah, yeah, you can see it on the picture over there. And, and the thorns were huge. They didn't just place that on his head. They beat it into his skull. Can you imagine the pain that that had, the hap, had that, that Jesus felt? And so the blood covers our mental. That's why anything that comes into our mind that's contrary to God's word, the enemy puts it there, but we our minds are covered by the blood and we can cast it over to the side. We can send it back where it comes from. You don't have to listen to it. You speak it up out loud. You, you speak the word out loud. You just say, you just speak to the enemy out loud. And don't listen to that because it will cause you to get defeated and depressed and down in the dumps and make your mind think things that you don't need to think. It's amazing. The sacrifice that our Savior went through so we could have life and have it more abundantly. Our sins being forgiven. They pierced his body with swords. Why would they want to do that? I mean, the man's already on the cross. Why do they want to take a sword and just shove it into him? Why do they want to pull his beard off? Why do they want to blindfold him and take their fist and beat him and say, prophesy, prophesy, prophesy? Why would they want to spit on him? Why? That was a, that was, that was coming from the enemy. Cause see, when the enemy seen what was taking place with Yeshua Jesus, 
He said, man, I got it made. Now they're going to worship me. But guess what? The devil got fooled, didn't he? Because on the third day, what happened? He left. He arose and he ripped from top to bottom that temple. So see, just like Aaron went into the temple before God, he had to go in there covered in the blood. But when we go into the temple, we have to go before Jesus and he's covered with the blood and we're covered with the blood too. He's the one that prays and intercedes for us. Because see, he done been through all this stuff. That's how much love Jesus had for us. For him to go through the suffering that he went through. So he would know how to pray for us when we're going through what we're going through. Amen? Amen. The cross means a lot. Jesus dying on a cross means a lot. The beatings that he took means a lot. Somebody was telling me the other day, I got a certain this and I got a certain that. And I said, why why, uh, why you say that? What, what Jesus did? Well, he died on the cross. Is that all he done? Just down on the cross? Well, if he took the stripes on his body for every kind of disease that the enemy has created, he's already suffered that, why would you say I got it? We need to watch what we say. We need to let our yes be yes and our no no and we need to pray before we speak. If he took the stripes, the beating on his on his body for every kind of disease that you can imagine, why would you walk around and say, I got this, uh, uh, I, I, I got this uh, uh, neuropathy or, uh, or I got this disease here. You're saying, well, he suffered everything else, but he wasn't man enough to suffer that. We need to watch what we say. And sometimes we get in our little flesh and we don't pay attention and we speak stuff we don't have any business speaking. And whenever that happens, guess what? You may feel the effects of what you just prophesied you got. Amen? So I want us to do communion uh, this morning. I want, I want you to understand the depth of it. That communion, the sacrifice that Jesus made, he became the final sacrifice for the sins of this world. And if you don't feel comfortable about doing it, well, then you don't have to. But I always like to remind, remember what my Savior has done for me. Thank you. And, and he says, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of what I did for you. That's powerful to have a Savior that loved us so much that he went through the torture and the torment and he never done nothing wrong. He never sinned. He never committed any kind of sin. But he's already suffered. Even the pains that you feel in your leg there, sweetheart, Jesus has already suffered that. Whatever we go through in our life, he's already suffered that. That's why it's so important for us to remember. As often as we do this, to remember what he has done for us. When I do this in the morning time, I, and, 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 I, and I talk to the Lord, I tell him just what I'm telling you guys. I, I break down and cry because... What I think about, I think about not only did God and Yeshua have a conversation, He already told His Son what He, what His, what He was going to be doing, what His assignment was on this earth. They already talked about it. And guess what? God and Jesus, Yeshua, was in agreement. So whenever He came to this earth, He knew what He was coming to this earth for. And if you're reading your word, he how many times he told his disciples what's fixing to take place. And it was on this day that he was crucified. They was having a meal of eating. They was doing the Last Supper or their communion on Passover. And he told his disciples then, one of you are going to betray me. They all got shook up. 
And the very one that, that betrayed him said, is it going to be me? And you know what Jesus said? Yes, it's going to be you. He gave him a chance to repent. But the money that he, that he got, and he was thinking that Jesus was going to be sitting on a throne up there, and he was going to be standing beside him as some big shot Charlie, that meant more to him. He didn't realize that what he was doing was going to cause him to be killed. And once he realized that, he wanted to give the money back, and they laughed at him. He didn't go to Jesus and say, forgive me. What did he do? He went out and hung himself, didn't he? Yes, he did. Passover coming up. This represents, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of what Yeshua has done. And this bread, when you hold it up, you can see the piercing on his body. You can see the beating that he took on his body with the brown marks. And, he, and Father, we just thank you for that. We ask that you bless this bread as we partake of it this morning in remembrance of what you have done for us in Jesus' name. Amen. We have no excuse to go the opposite because of Jesus Christ. This juice represents the precious blood that Yeshua shed on that cross for this world and everybody in it and for each one of us for the remissions of our sins. We just ask you, Father, that you bless this juice as we partake of it because you became, the Lord Jesus became the final sacrifice for the sins of this world. We ask that you bless it as we partake of it. And we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I hope I had not bored anybody. But I pray that, that when we begin to pray to God the Father that we clear up ourselves first. We judge us before we start judging somebody else. And when we do communion, we remember what Yeshua did for us and what God allowed that, and He allowed that to happen. I mean, you know, that, that right there shows you how much God loves the world, that He sent His only Son into this world to die for us. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I'm going to turn this over to Rock, I know that he's got uh, a word for us today from God. I know that. Get your notes out. Clean your ears out so we can hear and remember. What God, what God. Brian, do that back. Clean the other one, honey. You forgot one. <laughs> I didn't listen in here. That was a powerful message. Thank you, Pastor. Wow. It was a powerful message. I'm going to tell you what, if you felt like you were getting bored, you need to go back and talk to Jesus. You needed to go back and talk to Him and get a, a brand new perspective on what He did for us. So awesome. Mighty, mighty God, we serve. You know, we, we might give a little money or we might do a, we might do something for somebody. You might help in the yard work or do some painting or, or even suffer from some loss so that somebody else doesn't have to suffer loss. But when you look at what Jesus Christ did for us, That's true. eternity in glory, eternity in the heavenly. I don't put it like this. I don't care what price you pay. You ain't touched this price. No, absolutely not. It doesn't matter what you went through. Give it all to Jesus. Give it all to Him. Yeah, no matter what you're going through, give it all to Him. Count it all joy when you go through diverse temptations, you go through diverse problems and trials. Count it all joy. You may not feel like being joyous, but as I was speaking with some people over in Ghana, 
I, it just really got on me about the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. They're mighty through the Word of God. They're mighty through the blessing that Jesus Christ has fought and won and given to us. If we accept them, we don't have to accept them. We don't, have, we don't have to take the promises of God and live them out in our lives so that they become something that's grafted into us and comes out of us. We don't have to do it. But we have the opportunity. We have the opportunity to pray. We have the opportunity to give good measure, pressed down, shaken together so that someone else may benefit. But I'm going to tell you what, you're going to benefit even more because it's more blessed to give than to receive because the person on the giving end gets repaid by God. He said, go ahead, give to the poor. I'll repay. And God will always repay you better than what you've ever, ever given. He'll always give you back more than you've ever given him. And there's so many things that over this last week, that are coming up on Passover, that I began to see over in other countries, you know, the, the atrocities that are going on in, in uh, Ukrainian people, even the problems that are going on in Russia for attacking Ukraine. The people there, they're, they're not, not feeling the brunt of this. There's been sanctions and there have been other things that have been put on them and so they're now they're trying to get even. And, the, and the, uh, the president over there, Vladimir Putin, he's trying to do his thing. The world is in a flux. It's in a, in a, some kind of a movement is going on in the spirit. So the world's reflecting that. And the reason we see this going on is because God is getting ready to set the stage, the final stage for these things that, that we've had in front of us all this time. <laughs> you know, I used to tell this to the Israelis when I was over, I used to visit Israel quite often. I used to tell them, because they used to ask me to go, why is it, especially the American women, why is it when they come to Jerusalem and they get to the wall, they start crying, they get down on the ground, they're kissing the ground, they're, 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 they're crying out to God, Adonai, Adonai, Hanani, Lord, here I am, choose me. Um, and, and they're looking, especially the soldiers, they're looking at each other and they're looking at me like, Marze, what's this? Why do they do this? I said, you just forgot where you live, that's all. You just forgot where you live. For them, the greatest man who ever lived and ever will live, walked these streets. You, you forgot where you live. They recall the miracles that he did, whether it was the, the paralytic, or whether it was the man who was demon-possessed with 2,000 demons, or whether it was the woman with the issue of blood. I always loved that story. Because I think that she had a unique understanding of the blood. She knew, first of all, that it was an issue of blood. Somehow in her, on the inside of her, as she was having this issue of blood, she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, which is these little tzitzit that you can see on the palits here, they're, little, they're, they're knotted and they're tied and they're, they're kind of braided together, that sort of thing. And... When you count those knots, it'll count up to yod heh vav the name of God. And that's what you want to touch. You want to grab hold of the name of God. You want to touch him because that would be unlawful. But she was on an unclean state, and she grabbed hold of the name of God, and immediately she was made whole. She was healed. It's kind of a lesson for us that if we'll reach out and grab for God through Christ Jesus, our high priest mentioned before, Pastor. If we're grab, to grab hold of God, just to grab hold of it, and say, Lord, I need this. I have to have this. this is my, it's my life here. I've got sickness. I've got disease. I've got something, you know, and, and you know, you're going ahead and you're saying, Lord, I've got it, but you know what you need to do is you need to give it back. You need to give it away. Say, Lord, you take this. Lord, you take this. You know, and, and, <laughs> When I was paralyzed, I was a young man, I was in the prime of life, I was in my 30s, became paralyzed because of a tractor accident. And, uh, it, it, you know, your life suddenly goes from you're doing anything you want to do, or feeling any way you want to feel, and you feel like you've got the world, to suddenly nothing. 
you, you can't do anything, not by yourself, you can't get anything done, you, you feel kind of hopeless. And you watch things transpire. But I ended up, you know, as a kid from New York, let me just say this, I made every kind of deal you can make with God. I was a shyster as a kid now. I talk to you out of your lunch money and make you feel good about it. Make you feel like you did God a favor. That's the kind of kid I was growing up. But when I got to this situation as a young man, I realized that my deal making with God had come to an end. There was only one deal left. There was only one thing I had to give him. I'd already given him me. Go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. We got prayer requests. Uh, Nicholas Riddle uh, says uh, he's still in need of prayer. Okay, wait, wait, did you say what he needed for? That's what I'm waiting on now. Okay. So, Nicholas, yeah, we got that. And we, we heard what uh, what you put out there. And I'm going to stop here for just for a minute. You know why? Because it's more important That's right. for us to reach out to you. This is why we have an open channel. We want to reach out to you and we want to say, Nicholas, I don't care what you need is, brother. I want you to give it over to the Lord. I want you to give it to him. That's what I had to do. Is I had to give him the very thing that I had in my body. I had to make sure. I said, Lord, you are Lord over this paralysis. That's when I got my book. Go ahead, man. He says, uh, for my mind and reconnecting with God. Amen. My God. Amen. Well, I'm going to tell you what, Nicholas, you're on the right track right now. Because you're here today, you're listening to the Word of God, you're listening to the people of God. It's not just about me, it's not just about pastor, it's the whole body of Christ that's in here. It's called the body, it's not called just the one person or the, the, this healer over here. You know, the Lord told me just a couple of weeks back, he admonished me, and I mean, I, it was so loud I'm surprised that nobody else heard it, and I mean even over the internet. He told me to shut up. Because I was sitting there going, oh, Lord, how these great men, Dad Hagen and, and, and uh, so many other, Catherine Kuhlman, Oral Roberts, you know, even Benny Hinn, and so many other great men that have gone before and had healing ministries and, and they were working wonderfully. And the Lord told me to shut up. Because the same Holy Spirit that empowered them yes. is the same Holy Spirit that resides in you today. Amen. Nicholas, he's residing in you today. What you need is to accept what God is doing. You don't need to reconnect. You just need to get back in there again, get back in the game. Get off the bench, get back in the game, and begin to speak the word of God in faith and in power. But I want to tell you, before you came to the situation that you're having in your, in your mental facilities right now, is you began to let the word of God go. You began to rethink what God, in fact, let me say something to you because it's coming to me right now. This is what happened. You began to judge what God said. Is that really true? Isn't that what the devil said? Oh, did God really say that? Is that really what God meant? Let's stop going back and trying to second guess God and trying to act as if we can judge what God has said. God said it and it became. God called forth the trees and they were there. God called forth the man and the woman and they were there. God called forth the animals and they were there. How about the sun, moon, and stars? He called them forth and they were there. I'm telling you, when God calls you to be healed and to be raised up and to speak with the power of God, then you'll do it. Not because you have any power, but because God is all powerful. And if you do have any power at all, it's because he gave it to you. He gave you the opportunity to overcome death, hell, and the grave. He gave you the opportunity, and you can have it today. But it's your choice. I can't make you take it. And I can't keep it from you. But I can tell you who can give it to you in full power today. Just go to the Lord. Receive what he said about healing. You've heard from Pastor this morning. I'm telling you everything that we talked about today. And I especially love what you said about the crown of thorns. Now that's covering our mind. That's covering the inside of us. Where, you know, we get attacked in our mind so much. You know, I've asked people this and... And they kind of look at me a little a little befuzzled. I said, you know where your brain is, but where's your mind? Where's your mind? Your mind is an, is an area that's open between heaven and earth. You know how I know that's true? Because the scripture tells me it's true. How does it say it? Does anybody here recall? 
Set your minds on things in the heavens, not on things on earth. You can set where your mind goes. If it wasn't in your power and it wasn't in your authority, then Jesus would have said, stop thinking on the earthly things and set your mind on heavenly things. If you'll do that, then I guarantee you, you'll have victory. Because he said, what you declare on earth, what you bind on earth, is bound in heaven. What you loose on earth is loosed in the heavenlies. How is that possible? Because your mind escapes this mortal area right here, the physical area, and it transcends and goes straight into the spirit. See, these are the things we don't understand. So what happens is, is the devil tries to do things in our mortal body, like sickness, like disease, like all kinds of paralysis or uh, cancers or whatever it is, to get you so mind, your mind centered on the earthly, on the physical, to keep your mind away from the spiritual. Because if your mind gets set on the spiritual things, what you're going to start doing is you're going to start dwelling on the Word of God. And you'll start dwelling on things like, my God shall supply all of my needs according to His which is glory by Christ Jesus. You'll start dwelling on things that greater is He that's in me than He that is in the world. You'll start dwelling on things that He went to the cross and He bore every sin, sickness and disease. There's 39 root diseases and he suffered 39 stripes. He paid for every possible disease yes, that could ever be in yes. his present world. Yes, yes. I like what John said, that everything was made for him and by him, and without him nothing was made that could be made. I mean, there's nothing that will ever be in this creation that Christ Jesus didn't have a personal hand in. That's right. If there's sickness and disease in here, he allowed it. But did he allow it to prove you? Did he allow something to happen in your life to prove who you really are? You know, sickness and disease. I'm going to tell you what, I wasn't a happy camper. I was paralyzed. I had paralysis and I wasn't a happy camper. But I said, Lord, why, why did you do this to me? Why did you do this to me? I didn't say I didn't blame the devil for it. I said, why did you do this? Because all the way God's responsible for everything. He what the devil does. And because he's got ultimate responsibility, when we go to him with the problem, he also has the ultimate answer. Yes, he does. It, it's not. It's nothing. I got. Oh God, you're responsible for this. You know what God's reply to that was? Let me shock you. You know what God's reply was? God, why did you do this to me? Because I'm God, and you asked me to prove you. You said you wanted to be my child. You're going to be my child, and I'm going to be your God. But I need to have my children proven. My children may go through many trials, but I rescue you out of them all. But what is it going to take? It's going to take some faith in your part. It's going to take you making me Lord over that situation. And like I said, as a kid coming out of New York, making every kind of deal with every kind of person that could possibly be made and coming out on top, suddenly I'm in a situation where I'm on the bottom and it don't look good. I'm trying to make deals with God. God ain't a deal maker. God says it's my way or the highway. You want to know what the, what, I mean, God, God just kind of looked at me and he said, you know what, let me just tell you something, son. If you can sit on that bed for he died. I don't change. I don't change why I owe you. You can sit there and cry and you can bawl and you can squall. But guess what? It doesn't say in my word because you cried and bawled and squalled longer and louder than anybody else, that I'm going to come and rescue you. It doesn't say that. If it does, find it for me, because I want to know what Bible you're reading. And I spent long and hard. It was six months going through that. In six months, I'm going to tell you what, you find out who you are. You're going to find out who God is, but you're going to find out who you are. Anything you can confess, you will confess. You'll get it out of your system. And you'll say it two or three times to make sure you got it out. Because if you're you're beginning to doubt in your mind, just say, it, well, Lord, what did I do that caused this to come on me? Because you'll stop blaming him at some point and start looking at you. The real root of the problem anyway. Because you allowed it out of the words of your mouth, out of the actions and the attitude that you have, not only towards God, but towards other people. Mm. Can you love God and hate your brother? Hmm. Right. Because 
in the same measure you, that you judge them, he'll judge you. That's true. Amen. Can you love God and hate your brother? Hmm. You know, those are some of the things that I had to come to. So, well, Lord, you know, who is it? Who is it that I hated? Who is it that I cheated? You know, I had to come back. I had to come back for something. He said, oh, Lord. Yeah, I tell, I tell the story here of a, of a young man jumping from building to building while the young kid in New York was having a cop chase him. And coming down that way after I made the, he didn't make the jump. He didn't, he didn't want to make the jump, but I took the jump. I was only 10 feet and I was young and dumb and full of fun. Hey, bro, how you doing? Now you're famous on the internet. But, you know, after I made that jump and come down the other side, down the other, the other building, you know, and I come out that front door and there's my two uncle put for me. Come on over here, Rocky. We're going to talk to you. Because I didn't realize the seriousness of what I did. Do you realize the seriousness of what you're doing? Do you realize the seriousness of what you may be ignoring? That you just go through your day because you're so busy you can't get this done or get that done. I ain't got time to pray today, Lord. I got to get this over here done. Oh, man, I need a little bit more money, so let me work a little harder, a little longer hours, whatever it might be. Putting God last on the list of a hundred things. And the list gets longer, and you keep pushing him back, keep pushing him back. Well, you know what? He won't push forever. There'll come a point in time where you just say, enough is enough. Enough is enough. Not enough. You go ahead and do what you want to do. But you'll need me. Because you'll get to a point where you push God away far enough, the devil says, now I got you. Now I got you. I had Adam. I'm going to get you. But I thank God that we have one greater than Adam. Greater than our father, Adam, is here today. And if you desire it, Nicholas, you can ask of God today and be healed of every sin, sickness, and disease. But I'm telling you right now, the root cause of what's going on in your mind is sin. And I'm sitting here talking to you. I'm listening to the voice of God. It is sin. So I want you to do it. I want you to go ahead, just as we did here today, I want you to take the elements, whether it's a grape juice and a cracker or whatever you have, have there, God will accept it. Yes. Because if your motive is a pure heart, I'm going to tell you what, he will show up today, now, and heal you of what's going on in your body, with what's going on in your mind. Absolutely. Absolutely. Please stay in touch with us. The pastor just reminded me that as you know, as we're praying for people out there, please stay in touch with us, folks. You know, we're seeing healings going on on the other side of the world, and I know this because they wake me up at 2 o'clock in the morning to let me know about it. We're seeing healings going on. We're seeing healings going on here. We're seeing restoration. We're seeing things turn around in people's lives. And the end result is, why is that? It's because we'll get up and pray in the middle of the night. When God says, don't go, don't go to sleep, get up. Get up and pray. Set up a time with me. Get in the word. Voice my word out of your mouth. If you are part, if you claim to be part of the body of Christ, then why don't you act like it? Be the body of Christ. Be the voice of the Lord. Be the hand that reaches out to others. Be the foot that will go across the street just to knock on the door and say, God loves you. You know what? It don't cost you any extra. But what may happen to you may be astounding. Because somebody might get saved out of that little bit of kindness that you show, somebody might get saved. Somebody might be encouraged to turn their face back towards the Lord rather than going the route they were they were planning on going. That's how important it is. You know, I tell people this all the time, and pastors said it a, a hundred times. I know. Pray like your life depends on it, That's right. and pray like somebody else's life depends on it. We started out this year. I'll go back over what the Lord has done. Because because of Nicholas and what he called in. We had a young girl that was dying of COVID. She was dying of COVID. They were going to shove that tube down her throat because she stopped breathing on her own. Well, guess what? God called us to prayer. And within 10 minutes, we're not talking about days or hours or anything like that. We're talking in 10 minutes. They, they brought her back out. Because just as they were getting ready to go ahead and incubate her, what they what, what happened is she began to breathe on her own. Instantaneous. 
But what I want to tell you is that God may prepare you for something before the event happens. Don't fight God. Go ahead and say, Lord, yes, here I am. I love that. Look, we have this little uh, head covering here. It says Hanani. In fact, it's sitting back over there. It says Hanani. And Hanani means here I am, Lord. Choose me. Use me. I'm ready. Let me get in the game. And the end result is that we began to pray. You know, uh, it was just after the holiday season. It was uh, the first night of the new year. 2022, and I began to go into fasting. I felt like, well, let's dedicate this time to the Lord. So I'd already taken a week off of work and dedicated to the Lord. I was not into the prayer and fasting real good before this emergency came up. God knew what was going on. He knew what was about to happen. And he needed to get me prepared because at that third day while I was in prayer and fasting, I got the phone call about this little girl, and she wasn't going to make it. Well, that's when we really got into it. Because that's when I felt the Holy Spirit really begin to move. And it wasn't, it wasn't just a matter of not eating food anymore and just getting in the Word. It was, now it was a matter of crying out day and night. Hmm. Hmm. It was a matter of crying out day and night for her survival. It was a matter of crying out day and night, going to the Scriptures and Binding the enemy and casting him down. Reminding the Lord of what he had done for her victory at the cross. Putting God in remembrance of his word, as the scripture says. Putting the devil in remembrance of God's word. Letting him know he's a defeated foe. That he's nothing more, as the book of Hebrews tells us in the, uh, the first chapter, you know, he's nothing more than a servant to the heirs of salvation. And as a servant, even a disobedient servant, he has to listen to what you say. He has to do the word of God as you begin to speak it out of your mouth. Guess what? He doesn't have a choice. He has to do it. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And I'm telling you, he may have overcome the authority of Adam, but he has never, ever overcome the authority of Christ Jesus. And if the authority of Christ Jesus is in you by the power of the word and the power of the Holy Spirit, how does that manifest it, folks? It comes out of your mouth. That's why speaking the word in prayer is so important. so important. So important. That's not your words you're speaking. It's his words you're speaking. Amen. You know, uh, we speak in tongues here quite a bit. I mean, it, it'll break out. Man, I won't tell you. It, it, it'll get all over you if you let it. Especially with mama. Yeah, come on. <laughs> speak, speak the truth, brother. And I'm going to tell you, we're standing here. You know where I'm going to go with this, Tristan. You know, a lot of us wonder what's being said by the Holy Spirit when he's speaking. A lot of what's being said by the Holy Spirit when he's speaking is not your emotional distress. He's not worried about, oh God, what am I going to do? That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is saying, by your word, oh God, you declare. And by your word, it shall be done. For every word that comes out of the mouth of God, I'm going to tell you what, it has to be manifest. Because the Holy Spirit is the one that says, yes, yes, let me in the game. Open your mouth, the Holy Spirit's saying to you today, let me in the game. Open your mouth in prayer and watch what the Holy Spirit will do for you. Nicholas, watch what it will do for you. As you speak the word of God, the healing word of God, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit has come to your rescue. Because that's what he does. He was hovering over the waters. And he just standing, he just kind of just there. He just there, ain't nothing really going on. What's he waiting for? He knows it's got to go. He's got to know. He knows what the plan of God is. But he's not doing anything until he hears the word of God. And when he hears the word of God, when God said, Yahi or, be Yahi or, let there be light and there was light, the Holy Spirit said, oh yeah, watch this. And the creation began to expand from that point in time at 186,000 miles per second. And it's been doing it since day one. I don't know how big creation is. I can't find a computer that will calculate that. But if you take it by second, since, let's take it 6,000 years, I don't know how big creation is, but it's huge. Yes. And this is the spiritual creation. We're not even into the physical yet. That's true. But this is what happened on day one. People don't really think about the, the mathematics of it and the science of it. So I'm telling you, the, the scientists do, because they're always trying to disprove God. And what they end up doing is proving God. 
Doctors can't figure out why a little girl with, with, with three breaks in her arm, you bring her back a week later, and wasn't even a week, but five days. And they, they go ahead and they take the little temporary cast off and stuff, and they take the new x-rays and stuff because the swelling went down. They can't figure out that there's no breaks. So since they can't answer the question, what do they do? They get mad. Because science gets, gets stalemated. They go, well, wait a minute here. This is not supposed to be able to happen. We didn't fix this. We didn't, the time wasn't put into it. We didn't give her medication. We didn't do this. We didn't do that. And we didn't charge her a bunch of money either. But bringing her back, her heart was healed. And the doctor wanted to see me. I said, what do you want to see me for? I'm, only, I'm just the guy that drove him here. Well, I want to know what happened to the other little girl. What other little girl? The same little girl. You took the cast off. You're the one who put it on. Or, you, or your nurse did. And they took that temporary cast off and they, they did the, the new x-rays and stuff. And there was nothing wrong with her arm other than the fact there was these little white marks where the breaks used to be. Well, I don't know if it's all about money. I think it's all about their, I want to replace God. That's true. The government wants to replace God. Doctors want to replace God. Politicians want to replace God. Everybody wants to replace God rather than put God in the proper place where he needs to be, and that's number one. What did the devil say? I'll take my throne and put it above the star. Of the when I hear someone say, well, why didn't you do it this way? What I really hear is the devil speaking, saying, I want to replace God. That's what I hear. When you judge God's word, that's what I hear. I hear the devil speaking. Well, I don't understand why God didn't do it like this. Oh, God, why'd you let that happen? He said, because I need to prove you. I need to prove Abraham, too. I gave an opportunity. I gave Sarah an opportunity. And what did she do? She circumvented the word of God in her own mind, and they gave Abram, her husband, before he became Abraham, gave a servant. Give a, a, a servant. And her name was Hagar. She was an Egyptian woman. But do you know what Hagar actually means? Anybody here know what Hagar means in Egyptian? I have to understand a little bit of Egyptian. It means stranger. And this is a woman who is a stranger to God's covenant. In fact, the name never changes because, you know, when your status changes with what God, your name changes. Is that true with us? When we came into salvation, God gave us a new name. Why? Because when we get into glory, we'll be called by that new name. We'll not be called by the name we have for our given name here. God will call us by a new name. In fact, when glory comes, when the Lord comes and he begins to change the, the Yainu, this is to catch him away the believers, when you're changed in the twinkling, in a moment, you know, he's not gonna he's gonna call you by a new name. You ever wonder how that happens? You know, God has a pattern of doing things. He doesn't change on the same yesterday, today, and forever. Look at Malachi. I change not. In fact, in the in the Psalms and the Proverbs, he says, The word that I've uttered out of my mouth, I will not repent, I will not change. His covenant word is not going to change. So if you walk in his covenant, According to his good promises, you're in good standing. But if you decide to walk in some other way, maybe it's a tradition that you or your family might have or you yourself might have, I'm going to tell you what, God will not honor it. Why not? Because it's not being cut from him. It came from you. I can't tell you how many times I've heard prophetic words and knew it. And it came, out, came forth from that person's mouth, whether man or woman, it makes no difference. And I said, that comes straight out of their imagination. That prophetic word came shooting straight out and went right to the floor. Amen. I watched it. Boom. See, there are benefits to spending time in the Word of God. There's benefits to spending time in the Spirit of God. There's benefits. You'll begin to experience things that normal people, and I say normal people, regular people here and here, don't experience you ever have an event? I was on the phone one day. I'm typing stuff on the phone. I hear a young man speaking in tongues. Suddenly his tongue uh, turns to strict Aramaic. Because I understand Aramaic, and I know that he didn't. I'm going, okay. 
But what I heard him saying was exactly what I was typing. There's a connection. There's a connection by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was at work in the midst of that small group. He was doing something. And I suddenly had to turn around because I'm sitting there going, God, I'm at work. Stop. Tell me what you just said. I mean, I think I scared the guy. I was like, he got looking like, oh, but I do wrong. No, you didn't do anything wrong. I didn't even know what you said. And then he interpreted what he said. Then finally the pastor said, write it down. Make it plain. Write it down. So he wrote it down. Now we have the third witness. The first witness said, I was writing it on the phone. The second witness wasn't even coming out of his mouth, and I translated it. And the third witness said, he wrote it at the pastor's request. He wrote it down on a piece of paper. So three times that word got, got brought out. Hallelujah. Can't do that. Well, I'm going to tell you what. God began to do something from that point to this point because it wasn't long after that. I, I got a brand new car. I needed that to, to, to go from place to place to get things done. I, I know that the, the pastor had some things happen to her and her finances. And that began to, began to manifest. I know that the young man that was speaking in Aramaic, though he didn't know, he didn't know Aramaic from, uh, well, he may know it now from Hebrew, but because you never know what the Lord's doing. The Lord always does things. It's more than you can ask or think. And uh, I'm learning Ghanese, by the way. So the uh, the manifested power of the Holy Spirit should never be discounted, shortchanged, or go, well, that won't happen to me kind of thing. Because God is in the business of empowering his people. Nicholas, Nicholas, he's there to empower you. He's there for your healing, your complete healing. So that, what did we just talk about? That what's going on? happening to you, you can deal with other people. Because there's a bunch of people out there going through, right now, going through a lot of trauma, especially in the in the area of the mental. There's a lot of mental oppression going on. And I'm going to tell you what, if you're coming out of something like that, we need you to come here and pray with us, simply so we can reach out to people around the world and begin to pray for their salvation, their healing, and their deliverance from mental oppression that comes by the enemy. And the enemy may be working through other people. You know the enemy will work through your boss. The enemy will work through family. The enemy will not just work through your enemy. Oftentimes you'll find your enemy may treat you better than your family does. Depending on what the situation is. Amen. But what happens to us is basically we, we forget to call on the Lord. And the power of his mind. Let's continue to call on the Lord. Let's continue to pray and get in the Word. Let's learn the Word. You know, I don't know what your vocation is. We just came back from some training up in Atlanta, and it came with a lot of reading and textbooks and stuff like that and your hands-on training and that sort of thing. For some new machinery that we have over the airport. And uh, is that what God is bringing you to? Is He telling you to get your hands on the training manual. Is he telling you to get back in the Word? To search out the Word differently than you've ever searched it out before. Because I'm, I mean, this is what, nothing that I expected to go to, but Brian uh, brought Nicholas, and we certainly want to address that. But we just talked, we talked about healing. And I'm going to tell you what, Nicholas, you should have taken part in what we did here and remembering what the Lord did for us on the cross. Always, always, always go back to the cross whenever you have a sickness or disease or oppression, whatever it might be. Always go back to the cross. You can't do that enough. Amen. He said as often as you will, you can't do it enough. I it doesn't matter if you do it several times a day. Right. There's no prohibition. Right. You want to come against the enemy? I'm going to tell you what. You want to go to the blood? You want to go to the, the to the broken the broken piece of matzah? Because we use matzah because it has no leaven in it because leaven is a type of sin and since Christ Jesus was sinless, that's why we use matzah. When we look at it, Orthodox Jews made this. They did not intend to do this as a lesson teaching us Messiah, teaching us Jesus Christ. The little machine has these little things in it that pulls the, the matzah before it's fully cooked through the machine. And it makes a piercing through the bread. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what. And when it stays in the machine too long, then it burns a little bit and it looks like bruising. 
Now, when I first looked at, you know, I was looking at matzo one day, and the Lord began to speak to me about the matzo. Mm -hmm. that, the, that these were the bruises. That's it. He was bruised for our iniquities. That's it. Chastised, chastised for our peace. Mm -hmm. He was pierced for our sins, our iniquities. And I looked at that piece of muscle. I said, there's the story of Jesus Christ right there. I know the Orthodox Jews did not intend for that to happen, but the Spirit of God intended for it to happen. So that it would be this thing that so represents his body for us without sin now look just like him. I could see him clearly in the muscle. In fact, I was invited to a church. Now, I'm talking several years ago. Now, it's got to be 30 years ago, Pastor. I was invited to a church, and I took out a piece of matzo because they wanted to celebrate the Eucharist. They wanted to celebrate the Lord. I said, well, let's do that. Well, I, took out a, I broke out a piece of matzo. He goes, what's that? Because they were using this little white like, wafer. Right, right. And it's wheat. <laughs> and I was using a piece of barley bread because it was around Passover time. And he said, well, what's that? I said, well, this is matzo. This is the Jewish bread that they use, and they break it, and, and they celebrate Passover with it and stuff. He goes, I've never seen that before. I said, well, let me tell you the story about the matzah. And I told him the story of the matzah, about the bruisings and the stripes and the piercings and, and, and how it how this was the, the book of Isaiah come to life. And I, I think that's so profound because with the Orthodox Jews said, well, that's the, that's the forbidden chapter, Isaiah 53. Don't read that. And it come to find out that when they created the matzah, what they did is they created the testimony for Isaiah 53. They didn't intend to do it, but they did it because the Holy Spirit got in the middle of it. And he got in the middle of it, and he created this. You, now you can grab hold of this piece of matzah, and you can, just as the pastor brought it out today, you can see the stripes, you can see the piercings, you can see the bruisings. You know that it's this cracker that has no leaven in it, because leaven is a type of sin according to the scripture, and he was sinless, without spot or wrinkle, and his body was broken for us. I'm going to tell you what, there's power in it. There's power to heal, there's power to save, there's power to deliver. There's power to speak the word of God and have it come to fruition because God, God says, I'm good for my word. But I want to, I want to get off the earthly for just a moment. <coughs> and I want to talk about the heavenly because we made a statement here earlier, at least I did, excuse me for just a moment. Yeah. Feel the burn sometimes, especially if you've been up all night talking. Counseling people on the other side of the world. Listening to their testimonies about what God is doing. Hallelujah. You know that God is in the healing, restoration. He's in the saving business. Hallelujah. People over there are seeing the miracles of God by prayer that we're praying over here. That's why I try to get people to agree with me when I pray. Because if one puts a thousand of life, two put ten thousand of life, wherever two or more two or more of you are gathered together in my name, there I am to carry out whatever you're agreeing about. That's why when we talk about healing with Nicholas in our hearts and in our minds, we, we, we want to whisper it out and say, Yes, I agree. Nicholas is healed. Amen. You don't need to have a long, you know, you know, we're not here in front of an audience trying to impress. All we're trying to do is say, Lord, I agree. Nicholas is healed. You know, I love it because I go to the scripture and the story comes back to me even now about the, the, the man who was sick with a, well, I think it was with a palsy, some kind of paralysis. And his four friends opened up the roof because they couldn't get in because there was just such a crowd around the house. They said, you know, we got this. We got this figured out. What will God call you to do for a friend? You can't even go across the street. I doubt he's going to call you to tear up the roof. Though you may be more inclined to tear up the roof because it'll be a lot more fun. For those of us who have torn up roofs before, we've certainly done it. And you know, here they are; they're tearing off the roof, and they let they let their, their friend down, so he get right in front of Jesus. That was good. They pressed Jesus. Yeah. God, I mean, think about that for a moment. Will your act of faith impress God? It's possible they did it. I don't think they're any better off than we are. Is it possible for you to impress God by your faith? 
that something you'll do will catch God off guard. <laughs> now, that's a really big one right there. You're going to catch God off, off guard. I love it because, you know, this happens. You no, know, human beings can do this. Jesus was amazed at the faith of the centurion. He said, I, I never got great faith in all of it. Don't enter my house. Just send your word and my servant be healed. We, Pastor, we certainly prayed that. We got people being healed over there and God of, of what we prayed here. We prayed for healing. We prayed for restoration. We prayed for things that uh, in the voodoo and all the other kind of stuff that goes on. Their, their, their arts that they have. You know, that stuff has migrated over here. If you look over in, in uh, Louisiana and down in the island. Go ahead, Brian. Katrina Jones Sadler. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I know her. I know her. Uh, if I'm not, I apologize. Yeah, uh, you did. Prayer for my, uh, my family. Zane Sadler. Caleb Sadler, wow. Ronnie Sadler, and Haley Sadler. Okay, the whole Sadler family. Hallelujah. Father, we want to thank you for the Sadler family right now, Lord God. And we want to join with them by agreement, Father God. We don't know exactly what they needed because they didn't tell us, but Father God, I just want to agree right now. You know exactly what they need, Lord God. And I'm asking you now by the power of the Holy Spirit, Father God, to begin to move by your Spirit in the Sadler family. Father, not only things that they need, they know they need, but even things they didn't ask for, Father God, because you always do more than we can ask or think, Father. And I thank you for it right now in the name of Yeshua. I thank you for it right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I put you in remembrance of what Christ Jesus did on the cross for us. Every sin, sickness, and disease. Hallelujah. Every oppression that comes against us. Every evil, evil demon plan that tries to come upon us, Father God, you have turned it back, hallelujah, by the power of the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, our High Priest. He's standing at your right side right now, ministering for the Sadler family, hallelujah. Father, I just encourage you, hallelujah, right now, to pay special attention to the Sadler family right now. And Father, deliver them from whatever has been ailing them, Father God. Bring them to such a fruitation, Father God, that the people around them will see what God has done for them, hallelujah. Father, I'm asking you right now, win a testimony for yourself, O oh God, in this earth. Yes. Win a testimony for yourself, Lord God. We've talked about those who have amazed you in the past, Father God, by their faith. Father, I pray right now that the Sadler family will have such a great faith, Lord God, that they will see, Father, things and things they didn't ask for, Lord God. Think that more than they can ask or think, Father God, will come upon them, Lord God, because they stretched out their faith to ask me, Father God, for things that they didn't even believe for. Father, help their unbelief. If there be any unbelief, Father God, I'm asking you right now, hallelujah, to help them in every way, shape, and form, Father God. Cause a testimony for yourself. We're not doing it. They're doing it by their faith. We're just joining with the Sattler family. We're going to tell you right now, we're going to be real honest with you, folks. Hallelujah. We're going to be real honest with you. Here. The power is not in us. The power is in all of us. All of us together. That's why Jesus this. Uh, hallelujah. That's why Jesus said, if one to put a thousand to flight, two put ten thousand to flight. We all join with me and just pray for a moment for the Sabbath family. Will you pray for the folks that have put their prayer request in the basket here from, from weeks past and, and months past? Hallelujah. How many of those have already been healed, saved, delivered? Father God, we just praise you and thank you, Lord God. Father God, I know that where it says that we will pray for one for another so that you might be healed. Amen. We're not doing this just for other folks. Guess what? We get a blessing too. God did not leave us out. Father, we thank you right now for healing. We thank you for restoration. This is the time. We're coming into Passover time. This is the time of freeing us from every bondage. This is the time of freeing us from every oppression. You know, we've got a little, a little uh, board right here. It's on the ground. Uh, you really can't see it from the from the uh, camera, but you know all the things that are dealt with through Passover. Those folks were 430 years in bondage, and when they came out, none of them were sick. None of them were suffering from any disease. I don't know about you. I just don't think oh, that the the accoutrements over there were all that good. I don't think that they went in there. You know, it wasn't like the Hotel Six. Well, keep the light on. You have the light on for you. 
I don't think that they were treated with a lot of tender loving kindness. I think that they were brutally beaten, that they were starved, that they were overworked, and yet the Lord brought them out and none was sick. Hallelujah. Go ahead. Oh, well, she's saying agreeing. Okay, amen. Hallelujah. We got agreement out there from TV land and out on Facebook, but we want to praise God for that. Father, wherever two or more agree, there's no distance in Jesus. You know, I used to say there's no distance in prayer, but you know, I've stopped saying that. That's right. Because I've seen some prayers never reach any higher than people's noses. Because they were said with no faith. But they never went nowhere. They went straight down to the floor. But there's no distance in Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. Because when he starts, he's able to finish. So when we commit our prayers to him, guess what? He's able to take those prayers to the throne. He's able to take them to the Father. And he begins to say exactly. He's in agreement with us. He's mouthing the same things we, we said. If we're asked for healing, if we're asking for uh, uh, financial miracles, if we're healing, if we're asked for healing from past hurts, then guess what? He's confessing that before the Father. But he's not just confessing the problem, he's also confessing the solution. Amen. Hallelujah. And the solution is on the way. Because by the promises of God, everything is yes and amen to the glory of God through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And I want to open our minds up to these things that are, are not just earthly, but things that are heavenly. I want, you to, I want you to pay attention that we have a great cloud of witnesses. Hallelujah. Amen. As Paul talked about in the book of Hebrews. A great cloud of witnesses that are up there, and they're right now, they're beginning to testify before God of the same things that we're testifying down here by the Word of God. The testifying of the healing. The testifying of the bat battles that have been fought and won in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. A testimony for Him in the heavenlies. And they begin to take the Word of God, and they begin to speak the Word of God. Now by His stripes, by His wounds, we were healed. Hallelujah. I like it the way, I, that's, that's the way that Peter put it, Kepha in Hebrew. He said we were healed, perfect past tense. It was done at the cross. It wasn't something that's going to be done. It wasn't even something that needed to be done. It was something that was already accomplished at the cross. All that we needed to do was receive it by faith. And as we received it by faith, guess what? It began to manifest. Are you manifesting the things of God? Are those things begin to manifest in your life? They're manifesting here. Because we're not going to stop speaking the word of God. We're not going to stop exercising our faith. And as we begin to do that, guess what? The Holy Spirit gets encouraged on the inside of us and begins to act through us. He begins to break out in other people. He begins to break out in other countries. You know, Pastor and I have sat here and we and we agreed together about not even laying hands on folks, just sending the word. Amen. And we're seeing that happen over in God. Amen. We're seeing people being restored over there. Because the word was set forth. I don't want to ever, 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 ever confuse you with somehow God has given me the anointing no. and you don't have it. The same Holy Spirit that was in these great men of the past, Oral Roberts, Catherine Coleman, uh, Smith Wigglesworth, um, uh, A.L. Allen, Jesus Christ, Jesus said it himself, will God give me, I'm giving you, and greater things shall ye do, because I've gone to be with the Father. So we're actually in better position than he, than he was, because that's just the way he is, as a loving father and brother. But Father, I just want to thank you and praise you right now. Because there's nothing that's impossible for them who believe. If you have a prayer need, a prayer request, I want to encourage you to write it down and put it in the basket, and we're all going to pray on it. We're going to take. We're going to take. And let us know here in the comments. Yeah. We'll, like we're doing now, we're stopping everything that we're doing. Amen. To answer your prayers. Amen. It don't matter if it's now. Or if it's 2 o'clock in the morning or whatever time. So I like that. And Brian is saying, you know, we've stopped everything that we're doing right here so that your prayer request could be entertained. We don't want to sit here. You know, we, we say it here all the time. We don't want you leaving out of here the same way you came in. 
and that's true even of the broadcast. We do not want you to leave this broadcast in the same condition as you came. We want you to be in much better condition so that there is a testimony of what Christ Jesus has done for you by the word of God. Uh, and as Brian just said, he said, whether it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and I think they caught that because I've been woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning several times now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, at, at 11 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and then 4 o'clock. <laughs> well, we all let each other know, yeah. hey, we got prayer. We got prayer requests, and they're coming from all all places. I'm telling you, folks, you know, you want to be in the ministry? You better be ready. Pray now. You That's pray right. All the time. That's it. You're in continuously in prayer. Absolutely. You you you're in the car. Guess what? You're in prayer. That's it. You're you're getting. You're going shopping. You're going down. Just picking the stuff off the shelves. Guess what? You're in prayer. Mm -hmm. You may be singing a song of praise. You may be singing a hymn. You may find yourself in spiritual warfare as you're going to the produce aisle. Mm -hmm. But something's happening there. I guarantee that because there may be somebody in that same aisle. It could be the person right next door to you that's going through, excuse me, they're going through one hell of a battle. And they needed somebody to intercede. But because the Holy Spirit is listening and he's attuned to what's going on in them, guess what? He knows you're an intercessor and we should all be intercessors yes. for Christ Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Because he intercedes for us and we should be right there ready to receive that. Just like the little, the little head covering there says, and they need Lord, here I am, choose me. As we're sitting there and you go through the produce aisle, you begin to, I mean, the Holy Spirit's breaking out. You feel him rising up on the inside of you, he's beginning to break out. Let's get our minds off the earthly, let's get our minds in the spiritual, hallelujah. Let's invite him in and say, oh, on, Lord, what is it I need to be praying about for this person over here? That person may never know it's you. Sometimes we, sometimes intercessors take things personal. That's right. That's not the thing. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm going to tell you what. Personal. Are you taking it personal? Uh, there, there's a plus and a minus there in my mind. You know why I want to say there's a plus and a minus? But God told me one time, you pray for that little girl like she's yours. Yes. You pray for those people like your life depends on it. Because there's this. There is something personal about, about prayer. But don't be personally offended. That's what I'm talking about. You know, some people take an offense. There, there, you know, there, there's a, you know, God gets offended over certain things, and that they feel the offense, and they, they take personal offense. All of a sudden, they, they have an attitude towards a certain people. See, I don't have a, I don't have an attitude towards people that are, I know that are even in, a, even in faith practices that are not, that are not good. They're into, I'm going to tell you what, they're into witchcraft. They're into all kinds of things. They think they're serving God. They look at the word God told it's, it's, it's and I, I don't want to point anybody out, but I don't have a choice. It's Jesus only. Well, it can't be. It can't be. Not according to the word of God, it can't be. When he's on the cross and he cries out, the Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he talks about the promise of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit coming down on the day of Shavuot, Pentecost, as you know, can't be one and the same. They're three separate and yet uniquely unified. This is called a God. Three and one. This is why we have the letter Aleph, which is it's with the premier letter in Hebrew. It's a letter that Peter talks about. He says the day of the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. That is the numerical value of the letter Aleph. And the letter Aleph stands for God. Three and one. Unified. This is the kind of things that we need to know. We need to understand the very nature of God so that we can understand how to approach God. We don't just go up there any old way, only any old way we can. But some of us need to clean up our conversation. Because we got things that we've allowed the world to enter into our hearts and to our minds, and it comes out of our mouth. And I'm going to tell you what, it ain't good and it's not pleasing unto the Lord. But I want to get us to a place where we're, we're acknowledging the things that God has planned for us. How many people here know that Psalms 91, that God has planted angels round about us? Oh my God. Amen. That they're round about us. They've been commissioned by God to protect us. 
When you became a child of God, he commissioned angels to watch over you. Have you ever called upon him? You know, the book of Hebrews, back to the first chapter again, you know, says that all angels, not just some angels, not just the good angels, and not just the bad angels, all of them are servants to the heirs of salvation. All of them. So that means we can tell demons, bad angels, where to stop and to get out, but we can also invite the good angels to come on in and to take up their posts around about us, protecting us from the snares of the enemy. Let's make full use of the tools that God has given us. Now that may be a little outward for some of you folks, like hey, that guy's a little off his rocker or whatever. But I'm going to tell you what, when you start to see the power of God and the manifestation of God's miracle word begin to work in your life, yeah, you're going to begin to see some things happening. I used to be paralyzed. I'm not paralyzed anymore. I think you can see that. So does the word of God manifest itself in the physical? Absolutely. Absolutely. That little girl that was destined to die just this January? Yeah, she's not there. She's out there riding her bicycle. Now, in fact, I was gonna, they sent me a picture. I'm going to use it as my phone wallpaper. She's on her. she got her little helmet on. She's on her bicycle riding. No ill effects. No problems. You know, we've got a little boy that was having heart surgery. Everything is a-okay. Absolute, an absolute success. No ill effects. Even the uh, the hospital bills and all those things are now being taken care of, now being worked on by the grace of God. God is a good God. God is a good Father. He is closer than a brother. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So let me ask you, how many people here know, I won't put you on the spot, how many people here know that God is about to catch you away? That he's about to catch you away out of here and get you out of this place. Do you know what to expect? You know, we've got a couple of things up here. Hey, here we go. Amos 3 and 7, 1 Corinthians 3 7. And uh, in, I think in my Bible it's just 3 and 8. And uh, we, we talked about that. And, uh, you know, cause sometimes in the RMA it's a little bit. It's code a little bit different. The book of Malachi, you know, you have a fourth chapter if you don't. The, the end result is that God's not doing anything before he lets us know. That's the truth. That there is a prophetic quality to every person here. That God says, I'm not going to do a thing before I let you know. You know, when you get to think about it, what's the reason for the problem? Why the, prof why the prophetic utterance? Anybody really he here really know what the reason for the prophet is? To prepare. To prepare. Right, that's, a, that's a good word. I like that. But if you don't listen to God, guess what? If he's trying to get your attention and you're too busy with things, he's going to send the prophet to you. And he usually sends them in flesh and blood. And so he can speak to you face to face. Because, you know, just like the children of Israel, they, you know, when God was speaking to them, they said, no, no, don't let God speak to us anymore because we're afraid we're going to die. So God sent a prophet. In fact, he said two, Moses and Aaron. If you won't listen to the word of God, if you won't listen to the spirit of God, he'll send a prophet, somebody who's flesh and blood, to tell you to your face what God has said. And we're going to see more and more of that. Now, many, many times, I'm going to tell you, there's people that will come and say, well, you know, I'm prophet so-and-so. Okay? You've got to come with your title. Chances are you aren't. There's a good chance that you are so-and-so. And prophet is just something you invented for yourself. But if the Word of God begins to, to come out of you, and that Word of God begins to come to pass, I'm going to give special attention to, to what you say. Because I know, number one, you don't have an offense between you and God. You're not sitting there talking about God on one end and living like the devil as soon as you leave the building. You're not so worried about this that you compromise this. You compromise the word of God because you're so 
you're so interested in getting money for yourself and feathering your own nest so that you can live well and then pout it in front of everybody saying, oh, look how God has blessed me over you. You know what that is? That is the spirit of the Nicolaitan. Nico means to. You know what laity is? Anybody here know what laity is? Priests. Religious people. You have the laity. The clergy. And God hates the practice of the Nico laitans, who created a, a double standard, a double system, that they're up here and we're all down here. Let me say something to you. If the fivefold ministry is not in the midst of us, then it's no good. And then it's no good. Because he gave gifts unto men. He didn't give offices unto men. He gave gifts unto men. Hmm. When did the gift become an office? Oh, watch out somebody. I'm about to step on somebody's toe. Hmm. Come on. Get it. Get it, Lord. Don't stop now. That didn't come for me. Somebody out there need to hear this. Because you're a liar. And God's about to deal with you. In fact, something God's already been dealing with. He gave gifts unto men. The, the gift of the apostle. The gift of the prophet. The gift of the pastor. The gift of the teacher and the evangelist. The gifts unto men. Gifts that come by the power of the Holy Spirit. Suddenly they became an office to rule over other people. To tell other people, oh no, only I have the anointing here to tell. I'll tell you what to do. In fact, I'll not only tell you what to pray, but I'll tell you how to pray. I'll tell you what prayers you'll use and what prayers you won't use. In fact, let me put it this way. You'll say three Hail Marys and two Our Fathers. Nico Lady. That's interesting that that man has probably never had a real call on his life, number one. I call him Frankenstein preachers. You know, Frank, has they read the story of Frankenstein? He was a corpse that somebody electrified and came, to, and came back to life. I kind of look at their, their, their call in the same way. But if you're there and you're not honoring the Lord in the way that his word says, because you're preaching a different gospel than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me say something to you. How important is it for us to know what the true gospel is? Let me say something to you now. Well, I'm, I'm going to offend many of you, but Jesus did too. He said, are you all offended at me now? You're going to leave. Okay? You with it, right? Was he born on December 25th? Do you know what day he was born on? Did he die on Easter? Do you know what day he did die on? Was he resurrected on a Sunday? Do you know what day he was resurrected on? Are you preaching a different gospel? In the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is that why there's no power? Hmm. He was born on a festival called Tabernacle. In the book of John, it says that he came to dwell with us. And we sat right here, and the young lady sitting here in the front row, and I said, the word dwell is not there. And she opened up her Bible, and she said, well, sure it is, Rabbi, it's right here. I said, no, it's not. I said, it's not there. They added that word. Well, who added that word? Well, the translators, the publishers. She goes, she goes, well, no, it's right here. It's right here. Said, you know, you're not telling the truth. It's right here. So they researched it and found out that the word dwell is not there. That in the most reliable, oldest text, the word there was tabernacle. And he came to tabernacle with us. And the implication, even though it comes down in English a little bit archaic, 
The idea is that he came at tabernacles. This is when he was born. Why? Because tabernacles is an eight-day festival. Scripture tells us that he was born on the first day and circumcised on the eighth day. And if you only got one festival that has eight days, I wonder how hard that is to figure out. It's not that hard. But see, what happens is when a, another gospel was preached, they took away the festival so that you, you, you never understood that. Why is it so important that you know when he was born? Can you, can you look into the future? Can you project what's going to come in the time, the thousand year reign of the Lord? All the nations will go up to Jerusalem at Tabernacles and celebrate the Lord. Let me ask you something. What do you think they'll be celebrating? Think they could be celebrating his birthday? We know they're going to be celebrating the Lord. Why not celebrate his birthday? Especially if he's born on tabernacles. Why? Because he came to tabernacle with us. Because we are the house of God. The tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. The Ruach HaKodesh. And this is why he was born when he was born. Because it's only through him that we could become the house, the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. The body of Christ. So let's go on. When did he die? I don't know, you know, who, who knows what, what day he died? Anybody know what day he died? The Passover. Thank you. Why Passover? Why Passover? Our Passover lamb. These are Passover lamb. In fact, 1 Corinthians 5 tells us. Therefore, celebrate the festival of Passover. Not Easter. Not, not the bunnies and the chicks. Not the color day. Celebrate the festival of Passover because Christ, your Passover the night, go to 1 Corinthians 5 and find it for himself. 7 and 8, verses 7 and 8. Because Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So when we celebrate Passover, because we're admonished by the New Testament to celebrate Passover, guess what we're going to do? We're going to reach deeply into it and say, well, how much do I celebrate and what do I not celebrate? Am I celebrating us coming out of Egypt? Well, coming out of bondage, yes. But coming out of Egypt? No. Why? I don't know about you, but I've never been bondage in Egypt. I've been in Egypt, but I've never been in bondage in Egypt. Have you? Anybody here? So I'm not celebrating something that never happened. But what I am going to celebrate is this. In fact, let me go just throw one more, one more thing in there. You know, Jesus in, not, in any of the Gospels never really made a mention of coming out of Egypt. Why? I mean, when you look at Jewish literature, and you go all the way back, I mean, let's go back to Moses and Aaron and all that sort of thing, the end result is they constantly talk about coming out of Egypt. And yet, Jesus Christ, on the Last Supper, never mentions it, not one I owe. Why? See, that's, that's what happens when you're a good Bible student. You get into stuff like that, and you're like, wait a minute. The preponderance of evidence says that Jesus Christ, as a Jew, at Passover, the Last Supper, he said, look, I've longed to celebrate this Passover with you. He said that to his apostles. And on top of that, there's no mention of coming out of Egypt, one of the greatest things that have ever happened on the earth, and yet he doesn't even, he doesn't even give it an honorable mention. Well, why is that? How many people from that generation that came out of Egypt actually made it into the Promised Land? Yeah, out of that generation that came out of Egypt, under Moses, and saw the mighty workings of God, saw the, the Red Sea parted, saw Pharaoh's army drowning, saw the pillar of fire by night and the, and the cloud by day, saw the great miracles of God, and yet only two out of that generation of what? From They said uh, 650,000 men, so well over 2 million people, who made that journey came out of a, a wondrous, I mean, defeat for Egypt, and yet, Jesus Christ never mentions it. No. Nope. Why? Because that generation died in the desert. See, my only fear, and I'll use that word because it's a valid concern, my only fear about the Father and Jesus Christ 
showing us the great miracles of God in this generation is that we'll be just like that generation. So that we see the great things of God and we see the great miracles of God. Yet because of our unbelief, we will not yet enter into the whole place. That's my opinion. That's my concern for this generation. So, Father, I, I ask of you, and as an intercessor for the body of Christ, as God has called me to be, you know, that's why I teach you the things that nobody else would teach you. That's why I tell you things that nobody else would dare say. They'd be kicked out of their little club if they said any of this stuff. Are you kidding? That's why they won't let me in the club. Yeah. You can let me in the club, but you won't, you won't invite me twice. And we, are, we laugh at that, but yet it's the truth. When you start getting in there and say the things I just said, I guarantee you they're looking for the exit for you, brother. And it certainly happened. I, I can tell you story after story of what the greatness of God's Word has done. We were sitting in Austell, Georgia, in a Baptist church. That I was there, I was invited there, and, and they found out I was Jewish. Well, brother, do you actually speak Hebrew? I said, yeah, I speak Aramaic Hebrew, just like Jesus did. Oh, you speak the actual language that Jesus spoke. Yes, the actual language. Not Stein Hebrew like they speak over in, in north northern part of Europe. And uh, <laughs> he goes, oh, would you get up and just bless the congregation? I said, no problem. And so I did the Arana benediction. <laughs> In the name of our Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. And bless the congregation. I mean, half the congregation went got in the aisles and fell on their face. It wasn't because of me. It was because the power of God fell on the place. That's it. And, you know, we were there for, you know, they invited me back the next week. It was a, but a few times I got invited back. <laughs> so I came the next week and we continued in some prayers. You know, and we started to do some, some prayers that they, you know, It's a servant cry. Here I am, the blessed the living God, Yeshua Elohim Adonai Echad. And began to sing some songs and translate them into English. And the people got up and danced. This is a Baptist church, folks. People are dancing in the aisles. And he invited me back one more time. And then one more time, people started coming in. And a couple of guys were wearing probably on their head. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> where are you going, man? What are you doing? He says, well, you know what? I, I, we I thought we were really getting into this. I said, number one, you don't need to have your head covered. You're under Christ Jesus. He's your head covered. Let's, let's, let's take all that off there, number one, because that's how people get in error. And the end result is that at that point in time, there was a, it was a Bible teacher, elderly gentleman, God bless him, who had the Bible. He was teaching the Bible for, I don't know, maybe the last 30 to 40 years in that, in that church. And he said, well, brother, I'm going on vacation. I'll be gone for about two or three weeks on a ministry tour. And I thought, oh, well, that's fantastic. We're going to have the outreach in another church. He said, I'd like you to take the, take over the class while I'm gone. The adult class. I said, okay, that's great. And he had, I don't know, maybe, it, there was a crowd. I mean, the, the whole church was probably about 600 families. And, and he had probably had about, I don't know, 30 to 60 people that would come. 60 on a good day, on a real good day. And uh, so he was gone for the three weeks, and we went in there, we began to preach, we began to teach, we began to, to really get in some things about Judaism and, and, and how God brought the people out and that sort of thing, and we were doing some songs and some dancing and stuff like that, having a great time. Well, it kind of made him mad when he got back, because it wasn't 30 people in his class when he got back. In fact, we had to move the class from the classroom to the sanctuary, because there was over 300 people in the class. <clears throat> and he was mad because there were 300 people in the Bible. But this is what happens when you don't restrict the Word of God. When you begin to let the Holy Spirit begin to lead and guide you into all the truth. 
you begin to walk in a truth that you were afraid to walk in by yourself before. And we just began to share some things with these people, and these people were on fire for God. Well, he was a little bit mad, and I said, well, let me give it back over to you. Well, it wasn't long after that, and we're back to about 30 to 60 people and back in the other classroom. And why we were there by the power of God. And the only reason I'm going through these stories is so that you can see that God is working in your life if you let him. He may invite you to places you've never gone before to do things you've never done in that congregational setting before. This is something I would have never done unless I was in, in a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue, or maybe in a Messianic church. And in the Jewish synagogue, I've got up and read the Torah and do it in, in, in Orbe Shalom. Very orthodox Jewish synagogue. They allowed me to get up and read from the Torah. To actually sing from the Torah. Uh, rabbi Ashai was the rabbi at that time. God bless him. He's gone on to the Lord now. But it's a... Uh, <laughs> But I'll tell you, if you'll let God be God in, in whatever situation you find yourself, I guarantee you he'll take you from the mundane to the supernatural Amen. just like that. Amen. Just like that. We got into situations and, and, and uh, the pastor, a young pastor, and, and his fiance came up and said, look, we'd like to get married. I said, well, that's fantastic. I'd love to bless you. And they came up and said, well, we want you to do the wedding. And I raised an eyebrow or two because I'm looking over at the pastor because one of the pastors was, I want to say it was her father. I'm saying, well, you want to ask your dad? Of course, well, he was understandably angry. You know, he from Adam's house, Jack. And they, and they wanted to do a first century wedding. I said, well, I'd be glad to do it, but you're going to have to get permission from your dad. And then the, uh, the young man his dad offered me a thousand dollars not to do it. Tempting offer. Where I was financially at that point in time, I was a tempting offer. I said, No, I made a promise to your son I'd do it, so I'm gonna do it. Well, we went ahead and we we, we planned to do this thing in the church. But the church wasn't big enough. We had more than six hundred people that wanted to attend. So we went to the church across the street. I want to say the Presbyterian church. It was a much bigger building, they had an event center, all that kind of stuff. But we got there, we had booked them, and so we were going to do it there. But it didn't take long before we outgrew that one. So we had to find another place to go. So we went to the city of Austell, and we went into a, uh, an event center that they had. So we finally did the, the, the wedding there. And, I, you know, somebody told me, and I, I'm not sure if that's a but somebody told me there were over 3,000 people that showed up. <coughs> Most of the ministers and, and that sort of thing, because they wanted to, they had never seen a first century wedding. But when I realized the importance of what God had given me to do as a task, I called a friend of mine. He is actually a, a member of the priesthood of the Aaronic priesthood over in Israel. He is, he is a descendant, he's a Levite, he's a descendant, he's a breaker. So I called Ruben and I said, Ruben, I need to I need to come get with your brother because uh, I know that you built the Aperion. The Aperion is the wedding chariot that was for Solomon's wives. And so when Solomon had a marriage, he would put his wife in the Aperion and they would take her through the streets of Jerusalem. It would just run. And if the Aperion is not drawn by oxen or horses, it's held up by what's called the heroes of Israel. Four very big, strong men would literally put her, the chariot, on their shoulders and run it through the city of Jerusalem. So that the whole city could, could join in the glad tidings. So that was, I, I went over to Israel. I talked with Reuben. In fact, we stayed at his house a couple of days, uh, right there on Ben Yehuda Street. We were looking down at the cafe, down at the bottom there, and, and looking at all the, the folks that come to visit Israel. And uh, he, you know, he, we talked about the the uh, Aperion, this little this chariot, you know. And um, come to find out, things I didn't know about the Aperion is that uh, King Hussein, who passed now as well, his son, uh, King Abdullah, is sitting in, is reigning in Jordan. King Hussein, who loved Israel, actually donated um, cloth for the Aperion, but there was gold inlay in the cloth. It was about $3,000 a yard. So he, he, I don't know how many yards he actually gave, but this thing was beautiful. And um, 
So I said, Ruben, I said, look, I, I need to look at the, the plan or we take pictures of the plan or something like that. I want to make this thing as authentic as possible for these folks. I know that I can't make it as beautiful as what you have simply because I'm never going to be able to afford that cost. <laughs> so, I mean, this thing's shimmering in gold. I said, but I'm going to try to do as best as I can with it and by the grace of God. And so he did. He gave me a copy of the plan. And he said, you can only use it once. There's a stipulation. You can only use it once, and then after you use it for this wedding, you can't do any more weddings with it. You have to destroy it, take it apart. And so that's what we did. But you know, in this thing that we that we that we planned here, we got music from um, uh, where did we get the music from? From a group over there in Roswell. Um, the band was called Hallelujah. The guy that actually did the lead singer there at 16, he was singing for uh, Ed Sullivan. And so now in his 70s, he was just, him and his band were just going around doing this, this kind of wedding music. He was a wedding singer, literally speaking. And uh, his name was Klein. And uh, the first name was not Bill. But the end result was that basically when we got there, this, this thing was, was, the people were expected. They were expecting God to show up. You had that many ministers and you had that many pastors and people that were just looking to see this thing and to see what God was about to do. Now, you had a lot of naysayers. But what happened here is they were playing the wedding march and they had these double doors. And when the double doors opened up, the heroes of Israel, because they wouldn't fit through the doors, were holding it like this. And then in unison, they grabbed it and, and they held it straight up. They stiff-armed this thing with her sitting in it. And they brought her straight to the to the stage, which had about five steps. And they lowered it down so that she never touched the ground. She went from the wedding chariot straight to the to the stage where a set up there with the, with the house with represented the house of God. Do you know how much that is like us? That when we're picked up from this place and we're put in the wedding chariot by the angels of God, the heroes of Israel, and we're taken, we don't touch the ground again, but we're taken straight to the very throne room of God for the wedding supper of the Lamb. She got out of that thing, she stepped out of that thing, and then they, they played the wedding march. And she began to, she walked around one way and, and the groom walked around the other way and I was in the middle of it uh, in the, under the canopy, which represented the house of God and what we had is we had the uh, grape juice we had the grape juice and we had the matzo we had a full piece of matzo that we broke and they celebrated the Lord the first thing they celebrated as as a couple unifying in the house of God and that was the first time because everything was established by two and three witnesses so the first thing we did is basically they betrothed one to another they made a promise to one another he gave her actually a little handkerchief, and that handkerchief represents the Holy Spirit. For the whole, before the Lord left us, he left us with a gift, a very personal gift, the Holy Spirit. And that when he comes back, he's looking for that holy, that holy gift. Because those who have the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of them, he knows that's his bride. And that's how he would recognize her. Now, she had the veil on. You remember what happened, you know, with, uh, with Jacob, how, how Leah was wore the veil, and she pretended to be her sister. And so when the veil was listed, he found out the next morning, uh oh, he got the wrong woman. So he had to work another seven years. You know, because Laban was such a shyster, probably from New York. <laughs> probably a relative of mine. I, mean, I know for a fact that he is, a matter of fact. <laughs> and I, I won't go into all that, but I know that he's a cousin. And, uh, so the end result is that, you know, here you go. You have a, you have this kind of thing going on. So he lifts the veil to make sure she is who she says she is. <laughs> I've got the right woman here, you know. And as he does that, you know, there is this, this bright shining coming from her face. It's a manifest. You can see it. People saw it in the crowd. They saw it. The, 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 the Shekhinah, the Shekhinah of God was on her face as a veil was lifted, because she represented the bride of Christ. That's 
with that's how this works. And as that happened, you know, and you know, it's kind of like we're all kind of stunned there for a minute. Uh, we shouldn't have been, but we were. And so they began to take the Lord's Supper, and then they began to make their vows one to another. And there was another pastor that they had a good friend with the family who wanted to join in. He was in Germany, and so he he also uh, did a, a part of it in German. But after we were done, we did the music, and, and uh, it was a fantastic time of the Lord. And I had to uh, I had the great opportunity. You know that thousand dollars I mentioned earlier? Well, the father came back with the thousand dollars and just gave it to me. He said that was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. He said he could see the light of God on her face. He said, I, I've been to many weddings and I've never seen that. I said, Brother, you, you start doing your weddings a little bit different than you honor God rather than honoring man's tradition. You'll see the power of God. If we'll honor God, Rather than honoring man's traditions, we'll see the power of God. This is why I took this long road around the mountain here, kind of like Moses, 40 years in the desert. Should have bought a road map. He should have been obedient. That's what he should have been. The people should have been obedient. It took 40 years to get to the promised land. It took about 11 days. But we're the same way. Is it taking you a long time to get to where God wants you to be? Are you taking a long way around the mountain because of disobedience? I want to tell you, there, there's people in, right here in this room that should have been blessed a long time ago. I mean, supernaturally blessed a long time ago. But because of disobedience, God's our king. My promises are yes and amen to the glory of God. They're always, they're never yes and no, they're yes and amen. I'll never tell you no. Uh, is it something out of my will? I'm not going to, but if it's according to my promise, it's yes and amen. There's never a no for the promises of God. And that's why I tell people, if you're going to pray, go find a promise of God, because God has guaranteed that your prayer lined up with yes. His promises will come to pass. The problem is that you keep praying for stuff that God says, I'm not going to do that. Because it would violate my holiness, and it would violate my will, and it would violate my word. I'm not going to do it. So I'm telling you, body of Christ, if you're out there and you're frustrated with why God won't answer your prayers, you might want to go ahead and go look at the way you're presenting those things to God. And line them up with the promises of God. Because he will not change what he has uttered out of his mouth. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something. God's not going to change the day he was born. And God's not going to change the day he died. And God's not going to change the day that he manifested the resurrection. And God's not going to change the day that the Holy Spirit came down with the promise of the Father according to the prophet Joel. And God's not going to change the day that he has desired to change us in a twinkling of an eye and take us out of here. And for ten days we're going to walk around in our resurrected bodies. And I'm telling you, the greatest manifestation of evangelism over a billion souls, I was talking to the Lord about this late last night, over a billion souls saved in a 10-day period. Over a billion. God will not honor the flesh, but he will honor his spirit. Over a billion souls saved in a 10-day period. The greatest manifestation of evangelism in history is yet to come. It will be greater in that 10-day period than all of history in the past. And one one little hour. Why? You know how great this is? You know how prophetic this is? When you're changed in the twinkle of an eye, this is no, this is something the devil don't even he can't even he, I mean can't even uh, he can't prostitute it. He can't come up with a fake. You can't look through the scripture and say, well, the devil's going to do a counterfeit to this. There is no counterfeit for it. It is something, a, a work done by God that only can be done by God. And the devil says, I, I'm, I'm all out of tricks here. There's nothing I can do. The only thing that I can do is try to keep the body of Christ off balance and out of the word and keep doing man-made traditions. So if I can keep you in the man-made traditions, I'll keep you out of heaven. And if I can keep you out of heaven long enough, 
Hockey today. A lot of people, because of what they're about to see, will be saved. Not, I mean, not only through what they see here. They're going to make a promise to God and keep it this time. They made promises in the past, but they're going to keep it this time. Because of what they've seen. I'm talking about, I don't care what religion you're in. I don't care what religion you espouse to be part of. When this thing happens, you will come out of where you're at and you will become a believer in Christ Jesus. You will become a believer in the Father, hallelujah, and everything else will pale by comparison because you will see. I'm telling you, how do you think 144,000 Orthodox Jews are going to be converted in a very small space of time and become the next priesthood of the Lamb, the Kohen Haseh? We see that in the very first page of Genesis, and we see it over in the book of Revelation. Hallelujah. Even to the point where they're not afraid to die. Revelation 11, 3 tells us that they have no problem. They have no problem with giving up their lives because they are the priesthood of the Lamb. They see what is happening. They have never been with women, and there are 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. Mm. I'm telling you, God has a plan. God has this in plan, and he will bring it to fruition. There is a time coming of such monumentous proportions. But directly after this, after we're gone, that 10-day period, after we're gone, all hell breaks loose. There is a fiery mountain that is a, an example of the word of God that hits the earth. And this, word, this earth has changed dramatically. Is it just something that happens spiritually? No, it's going to be very, very physical. The earth goes from 365-day rotation around the sun to a 360-day rotation around the sun. Go ahead in the book of Revelation to find out for yourself. If you look at the time that the, the two prophets prophesied, 1260 days, 42 months, and go ahead and put that in relation to, to the earthly rotation around the sun, you'll find out that it's not 365 days, it's 360 days. So something's going to happen to the rotation of this earth after it gets hit by that first meteor. And it'll be seven years. And after the seven years, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is the return of the Lord. He's not going to change his mind. That's right. He hasn't changed his mind in 6,000 years. He's not going to change it now, folks. The best we can do is get in line and say, Yes, Lord, I know your word is true. Father, we just praise you and thank you. We know your word is true. We know that what you did for us on the cross is true. We see the power of your Holy Spirit. I love it every time we get, we're invited to somewhere. Pastor and I have the opportunity to go out and speak a word of blessing to someone. And the pastor, especially what a gift, I'm going to tell you why. And she begins to, you know, someone she sees and, and, and the Lord just speaks to her a word about that, that person. It's a word in season. Because that, that word goes in and it does the work. And whatever it is they're going through, God is dealing with it and it's a word of encouragement and a word of power. Hallelujah. So don't let healing escape you, Nicholas. Family that's out there, don't let healing escape you. Because God is at work. If you will let him work and work in you, God is doing a supernatural work in the body of Christ today.